Hello and welcome to the demonstration video for Inscription Augmented version 0.4 beta running on Tabletop Simulator version 13.2.2. If you're watching this, chances are that either A, somebody linked you here in a Discord channel demanding that you learn to play with them so they can shamelessly destroy you with superior experience, B, you found this link in the Tabletop Simulator mod and are either cautious enough to learn the proper rules or confused it doesn't work like the video game, or C, you're watching it purely on your own volition to see if the format looks worth playing. In any case, this is going to be a relatively brief overview of the super basic rules you need to know to legally play the game. Let's have a look at our cards, we know what we're dealing with. A wolf, a classic. Up here's the cost, two blood, along the bottom we see that it has three power and two health, and also that it's a canine card. That is a tribe. They're usually not important, but sometimes they are. Fetch me something else. Ah, bone heap. This one's a fancy rare card. It's got two sigils here, sharp quills and an activated ability. Those are neat, we'll talk about that later. One more. Uh First things first, let's make a deck. Actually, you have to make two of them. Your main deck and your side deck. Throughout the game, you'll have the option of drawing from either. The main deck is generally the more interesting part with actually powerful cards, but let's talk about that side deck first, because it's still pretty important. It has to be exactly 20 side deck tier cards. They're usually free and basically just give you resources to play actually powerful cards. The squirrels are basically the only one that can be sacrificed. They give you blood. Cairns and skeletons instantly give you bones when played, and usually end up generating some extra bones afterwards. Leap bots are good for blocking damage while you stall out and wait for your energy to charge. Null conduits help you instantly complete a circuit, which is a bit more of a niche energy mechanic, don't worry about it for now. Mocks are the most reliable cards for providing gems, which is how you play magic cards. They're kind of their own thing. You can mix and match any set of 20 you want, but it's usually a good idea to just have 20 of the same cards so you know exactly what you're going to get every time you draw from the side deck. That aside, let's get back to the main deck, the real deck. It has to be at least 20 cards in total, but it can go all the way up to 40 if you really want that many. Much like the side deck cards are separated into their own class, there are four different tiers of cards that can go in here. Common, Uncommon, Rare, and the Everprise Talking Cards. Common cards are going to be the majority of your deck. You can have basically as many as you want, but only up to three of the same one. Unless it's zombies or regular bees. You can also steal some extra side deck cards and put them in here, pretending they're commons too, which I guess is useful if you really want to make sure your actual side deck is completely pure. Editor's note, the mod also separates out these sub-cost cards, which function identically to commons, except they cost a different resource. Uncommon cards are basically the same, but you can't search them out with cards like Librarian or Magpie, so you actually just have to draw them normally. Sad! Rare cards are the secret sauce, a controlled substance. You can only have up to three of these things total, and all of them have to be different, no copies. And lastly, the mythical talking cards. These things ain't cheap, and you can only have one in a deck total, because if you put more than one in the same spot, they'd get wise and start trying to plot out how to- You'll recall earlier, when I was going through the side deck options, that there are four or so different resource systems for them to play into. Blood, bones, energy, and gems. There are also four different thematic temples that cards fall into, and since each of them primarily focuses on one resource, I'll more or less be treating them as one and the same. Blood cards, mostly beast cards, are paid for with sacrifice. A two blood cost means you have to have two cards live on your side and then kill them off yourself. Every card only gives back one blood when you sacrifice it no matter how much it costs, unless it's one of those weird ones that counts as more than one blood, or unless you can't sacrifice it at all. Bone cards, mostly undead, are paid in bones. You get a bone every time one of your cards dies, and also by a bunch of other ways that usually only matter if you're running a mostly undead deck. They stick around until you spend them on something. Energy cards, mostly the tech ones, are paid for with your little energy cells here. You start your first turn with one and get a brand new one at the start of every turn after that, not to mention all the extra little secret ways to get more. Funny thing is though, you're only spending the charge in the cells, not the cells themselves, so even if you spend literally all of them, you still get them all back on the next turn. Unless you play one of the beefier cards that actually does take the whole cell, but those are clearly marked. Magic cards are weird. For every colored gem on a card's cost, you need to have one gem of that color provided on your field. Usually that's going to be from Mox cards. For every gem that's been slashed through, you need to kill off a card that provides that gem. This is called Shattering, and it is not the same as Sacrifice, technically, even though they are pretty similar. The white gems are called Prisms, and they can be paid for with any color of gem. Your best option is usually to pick one major resource, pick out a side deck that matches it, and then mostly run cards that cost that resource, but throw in a few that cost the other ones, because remember, Almost all cards can be sacrificed. Every card drops a bone when it dies. Except for the few that don't. 
Slowly but surely, you're guaranteed to build up energy eventually. As far as gems go, there are a handful of random cards that provide them, but for the most part, it's all or nothing. So, you have a valid deck now. Excellent, let's find someone to beat up and go over how the game is actually played. The board setup is a little abstract, but all you truly need is a battlefield with four lanes on two sides and some sort of sliding scale counting device that goes from negative 10 to 10, including zero. Per tradition, this is called the scales. It represents both players' health bars at the same time and always starts right in the middle. It's also tradition to have a little bell to ring to mark the end of your play step, but you can just come up with some other agreed upon cue to count as ringing the bell. Shuffle your decks and set them down. Main deck face down, side deck probably face down, but if it's all one card, then you can leave it face up to be fancy. And draw your starting hand. Three cards in the main deck, one for the side. If you really hate it, you can shuffle everything back together and try again, but there's no taxi maxis after that. Flip a coin to see who gets to go first. Keep in mind, though, that the winner of the coin flip can only deal up to two damage on the first turn. The turn goes like this. Your draw step, your play step, then you ring the bell to start the attack step, and then sometimes an end step happens, and then comes the next player's draw step, and so forth. If this is your first turn, you don't get a draw step because you literally just drew an entire hand of four cards. Every other turn, however, you get a new energy cell and fill all them up, and then you draw one card from either of your decks. This is mandatory. You have to. If you don't draw a card, then comes the part where you actually play your cards. If you have no resources and no other cards on the field, then you can only really play free ones. Otherwise, refer back to the resources section. This is also the part, though, where you can use these special little sigils called activated abilities. They almost always have a cost, and they do various things. There's also this special surprise tool called the hammer, which you can invoke once per turn to destroy one of your own cards for literally no reason. It doesn't have to be sacrificable, and it doesn't count as a sacrifice, but it also doesn't count as perishing by combat. Once you think you've messed with your board state enough, ring the bell to announce that you're done and start dealing damage. All of your cards, in left to right order, from your own perspective, will strike at whatever's in the space that opposes them with a power level according to the green number in the bottom left. If there's a card there, it will take the damage and possibly perish. If there's an empty space there, your card will deal that damage directly, and it will be marked on the scales. If the scales get all the way to 10 on either side, that player loses the match. This is the win condition. Immediately after the attack step is the end step, where nothing necessarily happens, but a lot of cards have specific effects that they try to trigger. They carry them out in the same left to right order as attacking. Due to the nature of how the cards will be laid out, some of them might not be able to, in which case nothing happens to them. Now, remember before when I said that drawing a card in your draw step is mandatory? If you can't do it, that means you're starving. You'll take one damage instantly. If it happens another turn, you take two damage instantly. The next time you take four! So on and so forth. I really doubt you'll survive that long. And that's the gist of it. As a few reminders. A card's attack is made up of one or more strikes, which is a form of damage, which is one way for a card to lose health. But... A card can lose health without it counting as damage. A card can deal damage without it counting as strikes. Extra note from editing. Perishing by combat only applies if the cause of death was directly related to some form of damage. Most notably, this does not include sacrificing, shattering, the hammer, sigils that cause the card to kill itself, such as brittle or rotting or poisonous. One card is allowed to provide multiple gems at once, but you can only shatter it to pay for one color cost at a time. In the same vein, if you somehow get a sacrificable card that also provides gems, you can sacrifice it to provide blood or shatter it to provide shattered gems, but not both at the same time. Remember that you get new energy cells and refill your energy during your draw step each turn, not your end step, Mark!